years, I was able to make up for that money and not even have to touch no dope. But the, the, the part about it is, is I was doing it with a homie of mine, well, who I thought was my homie, a person I came up with, and then he got into some trouble and then he lined me up. So what he did is he started asking me for drugs and he knew I wasn't really selling drugs no more, but he told the feds that he and I were doing this kind of fraud. And they like, well, it'll be too hard for me to prove this fraud stuff, plus it doesn't carry as much time, so set him up on a drug buy. And then, you know, he asked me for months and months and months to set him up with a drug buy, and then I'm like, nah, we don't need that. Why are we going to do drug buys? Like, we're going to make 8 Gs, 10 Gs, 20,000 this week, but eventually it's my homie. He brought some guy in that he said was his out-of-town buyer, and it was like money on the floor. I'm like, okay, well, shit, how much are we gonna make? Is this him right here, he cool. The guy went out to he went out um to clubs with us, bars with us. He messed with girls with us, but he actually ended up being a um federal informant. Yo, what's poppin'? You know what time it is? Your boy, Mr. J Hill, J Hill Podcast. Oh, man, this episode right here is going to be a good one. Uh, I got a guy coming all the way from Oakland, and literally, like, he ain't, like, in Atlanta just stopping by to do the interview. No, he came all the way from Oakland to do this interview. And uh, I was talking to my dog, Ken. He was like, yo, this is one of them them, them dudes that really come from the, the trenches that, like, he was one of the first people that I seen make a million, and his story is incredible. And like I told y'all, man, I've been big on, like, forget the numbers and, 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 and the platform, but really wanting to dig deeper into the story. And this guy, he has one of them, them real stories coming from, cut from the same cloth that I'm coming from. You get what I'm saying? And y'all know I love talking to people that's cut from a similar cloth. My guy, True Lane Brown, is in the building. What up, brother? What's going on, man? It's good to be here. Already, man. man. Straight up. Yo, so let's, 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 let's go straight to it then, man. I uh, mean, you know, I mean, True Lane Brown from Oakland, California, East Oakland to be exact. I mean... It was a pretty long flight to get here, but I had to get in front of you, man, getting on your podcast because I love what you do. Some of the people that you've had on before I um, listen to on other platforms and get a little bit of inspiration based on the direction that I'm going now after I overcame everything that I spoke to you about early in, uh, earlier and off camera. You know what I mean? So it's good to be here. Yeah, man, I appreciate you for pulling up, for real. Mm -hmm. If we can, get into some of the things that we talked about off camera. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I grew up in East Oakland. You know what I mean? It was... Uh, it was a crazy time, man. Back then, um, it was, I guess you could say, the pre-crack era. So I seen what my community was like before crack, and then I seen what it what it transitioned into. So what that happened was, you know, uh, you had a lot of median income people back there. You know what I mean? They were living, surviving, but then you had the lowest income people also. So what happened was my parents actually worked, but three blocks away, none of my friends had parents that worked. They were on welfare, government assistance, food stamps. We went to the same school. So what ended up happening was um, they didn't have food at their house, and we did. So I had to kind of like roll with them, ride bikes with them, climb trees with them, doing stuff that young boys did. But then when it was time to go home, they wanted food, so they would come to my house to eat. So we start finding little ways to make money, like uh, pushing baskets at the grocery store for a quarter each, um, um, maybe selling candy. Of course, everybody sold candy, but we were doing it in um, – going to the suburban neighborhoods, getting candy from the Price Club for about a dollar, and then we just go ask for donation to people, you know, mainly white people, man, and we figured had more money than us, man. But uh, after a while, all of that stuff played out because we start seeing guys a little bit older than us in our community having real money. And what I mean by that, for a kid that's 8, 10 years old, a person having $100,000 is a lot of money, Hell especially yeah. in an urban community where everybody get their groceries from the same market. Everybody goes to the same school. Everybody goes to the same church. So uh, we start asking those older dudes, how could we get in it? How could we get in it? But they forbid us from getting in it. But it was still in our face. So how long can you show a dog a steak before he tries to take a bite and you not give it, whether you give it to him or not? So they would they didn't want us to eat, but we found a way in it anyway. So my route was um, basically going over to the car wash, helping the older guys wash their cars. Wash their gold rims on their Mustangs, Cougars, old school Chevys, and then they start having uh, cars like uh, BMW 3 Series, Saabs, and all of these other kind of cars, and getting like 40, 50 bucks in a day just for helping a person wash their car. So I figured they must be rich. After a while, um, my desire for more kicked in, 
and I just started hustling, man. I went full-fledged, man. It started off helping my friends, and it ended up me wanting to make a business out of it. Mm. So, I mean, I ended up, uh, you know, jumping in the game. By 15, 16 years old, I was actually, you know, being able to supply my friends. And a lot of people will be like, well, that's nothing to glorify, and I'm definitely not glorifying that. But if you're in something and you consume with it, why, why, why not take advantage of it while you can because nothing good lasts forever was my thought as a kid, which I really wasn't thinking clearly anyway because a lot of trouble came with that. So wait, let's go back. So you 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 went from you was buying some stuff at the grocery store, right? Mm-hmm. Asking for donations, then washing cars. Yeah. And after that, that's when you went full time like hustling. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, basically, you got to think washing cars and washing rims on people's cars, which were the hustlers because they come into the neighborhood car wash, which my mom, by the way, told me. Don't be hanging at the car wash because that's where all the hustlers hang at and all the D-boys or whatever you want to call them of that era. And um, I snuck over there anyway, rolled my bike over there. It was like four or five blocks away from my house. Mind you, I we I lived in the house. Like, my parents were married. They both had jobs. But my all of my friends lived in these housing authority uh, kind of like low-income apartments. But they were my friends, and I didn't care and nothing about that. So, um pushing those baskets, asking for donations for candy, washing rims turned into about one year. Me spending like fifty dollars to make a hundred, a hundred dollars to make two hundred, two hundred to make four, and so forth and so on. So it didn't take me long to catch on that. Wow, this is going to be the way so I can make my first thousand dollars. So if I can get a thousand dollars at eleven years old. That was significant to me, but I had to hide it from my parents. I had to make sure that I um, excuse me, I had to make sure that I did it strategically. However, strategic an eleven year old kid can be. Mm-hmm. So that's what ended up happening. But my friends, right. They did it for survival because if they didn't hustle, you know, sell rocks in the hood, they probably wouldn't have no food at home later on that night. Their moms was on it. Sometimes their dads was on it. Most of the time they didn't even have a father in the house because if you have a government subsidized apartment, the mother had to live there by herself with the children. The father couldn't come in. I know you probably heard of that before. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a true thing that the families had been separated based off of we'll give you this if you do this. So, um. Basically, they did it for survival, but since I was doing it and I got the hang of it, I just made it into a small little business early on, which is um, ended up spiraling out of control. So when did you go? When you say hustling, like what type of hustling was you doing? You selling weed? Like this um, back- we start we started off selling coke, man. We started start off selling the rocks because that was what we what was surrounded. Our, our community was surrounded and, and infested with it. So it wasn't there when I was about six years old, five or six years old. And then by eight years old, it was everywhere. All, all of a sudden, it was everywhere. So we're watching 17-year-old dudes in our community become millionaires. So by the time I was like 12 years old, we had several millionaires in our community off of crack. Mm. So I'm like, is this by design or is this by accident? Whichever way it was, I still took part in it which was a negative thing. However, I tried to take advantage of it to the best of my ability, like I said, as an irrational thinking kid. So wait, so you, because you use Coke and uh, crack interchangeably. At what, was you selling Coke at first and then they started to cook it? No, I didn't touch the Coke at all. When I first got it, it was crack. It was rocks already. So when you, um, when you do that, it, it's like whoever formulated that formula made it so highly addicted highly addictive the people in the urban communities didn't want the coke Mm. they only wanted the rock you know what i mean and then with that being said they came for it and they would run around and they would chase it and they would do anything for it and then they start being called strung out and fiends and uh, you know all all of these things that they associated with this drug you know what i mean when when, when that change happened from like the coke to crack uh era what, what was like the biggest significance or the biggest change that you was able to see like off offhand um, I think the people who you saw doing really well that just maybe use Coke start noticeably declining when they use crack wow. because it was a thing that you had to chase. So in that era, I think you had to have about $25, $20 to $50 to buy some at first. So what they ended up doing was um, anything they could to get it, go steal VCRs, break in houses, um, 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 shoplifting, um, women sold their body for it. It just was all of these negative things that came along with it that you saw it because the, 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 the prettiest girl in our neighborhood that all the young boys used to look at and wait for her to come out of her house and follow toward her to the bus stop, start looking busted. She started looking all, 
you know, scratching her face. Now all of a sudden they're like, oh, she's using the rock. They're like, no, 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 no. But then it's multiple people. And then the toughest guys in the neighborhood who were considered to be OGs or, 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 or whatever you want to call them, they start turning into like common fiends too. Like, hey, let me hold something for 20. Let me hold something and pay you back later. I got some girl in a hotel room that want to do something with me for, for a piece. And then me as a kid start losing respect for guys who basically succumb to their weaknesses. Like, what are you doing, bro? I looked up to you two years ago. Now you're coming to me borrowing $20 for a rock. So mm. I start noticing the community declining even further, which we're talking about a low-income community anyway, which is a 30, 40,000 income that you put this thing there, now we're all looking crazy. I mean, everybody didn't participate in it, of course, and it was a choice that I made, but the community started going downhill from there. And you was like 12 when you first started? Well, no, when I first started, it was about in between <clears throat> 10 and 11, but I started taking it serious about 12. Like, oh, I'm going to really get some money off of this. Like, I need some paper because I'm looking at dudes that's a little bit older than me that have the girls that I like, and they don't see me because I'm just riding bikes and riding the bus. Now I'm about to get some real money. I'm going to turn this into some money right now. Yo, at 12, right, like, outside of the bread that she was getting, when you see that it's really changing your neighborhood, was you able to see that at 12 and understand it? Not just see it, but understand what it was doing to your community at the time? Well, I actually I actually um, was watching the news a little bit. So the news were, were was highlighting every time they busted somebody for it. Okay, we, we're making an impact because we're busting these drug dealers. Look what we did. We found $30,000 inside of a crack house, and we took five people to jail. And these are the people that's ruining our community. So I was able to say, wait, these are the same people that brought us this, but they're talking about how they're taking us down and making impact by cleaning it up. So this is a catch-22 right here. So I believe that I was smart enough to rationalize it, to answer your question, and I was wondering, like, okay, I just need to stay under the radar with it and I can get by doing the same thing that I'm seeing the guys that are really making money do. So, and again, I, I don't want you to, because uh, we got time, I don't want you to, don't tell me your thought as of now, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm asking this, like, so even at, I'm saying at 12, you was able to formulate an opinion to say that the people on the news is what, what, what brought the crack in our neighborhoods. You knew that then. Yeah, because I had older cousins that were already up to kilo level. So, I okay, they lived in a different part of the city. So going over there with them and then they're meeting people to get their supply that don't look like us. So about 11 years old, I'm like, wait a minute, who was that guy in that car? And they don't want us to see. So these people, you know, they're not black. They're bringing them stuff like high, 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 um, uh, um, high, large amounts. So I'm like, wow, even at 12, maybe 11 that. Okay, first of all, let me just go back. The violence in those communities, communities at that time, it was already whispers of kids my age being shot and killed, like getting caught outside at night trying to sneak and hustle, trying to get some money. So what ended up happening is like, hey, bro, if you're going to be outside, you're going to need a 38 or a 30. You're going to need your own gun. And I'm like, why? He's like, because... It ain't safe out here, man. You don't be hearing about these murders at night. The, it, it was like some of the highest murder rates in those years. So, of course, now it, it don't take much for me to comprehend what's going on. And long story short, man, if you're going to be a victim of it, a, a participant in it or a victim of it, it was kind of only two ways to go. Or you can hide in your house. Mm. Don't come outside. Don't interact with the people and then be almost a prisoner in your own home. Yo, how you go from like hustling, washing cars and, and, and rims and candy to even getting your hands on crack? Because I know, I, and, and we were just talking about this, when I was coming up, my old heads was telling me like stay in school. Mm -hmm. It was like, yo, play football. Like, you know, don't mm -hmm. do this. You feel me? Don't like, of, yeah. of course, some of my friends end up getting into it, but I'm curious, like, how did it end up being in your hands? And my, okay, <laughs> so what happened was um, I started asking the older guys to put me on, put me on, put me on. And they did the same things like, nah, you come from a good home, just stay in school and stay out of this. These other guys over here that live around the corner, they need it, so we'll probably let them work some for us, but you can't. And then eventually, it was one guy in particular, he, um, he actually, it's a, it's a quick little story, he actually had somewhere to go one day, and he left me with about like two, 300 worth. He's like, okay, I'll be back in a couple hours. Matter of fact, um, go home and iron these Levi's for me. And um, when you get back, I want you to help me out until I get back, right? So he gave me a little sack. 
And when he came back, I was already waiting there for him with all of his money. So he's like, oh, you finished everything? And I was like, yeah, um, I needed more. And he's like, all right, well, don't worry about it, man. I just needed you that one time. So then he gave it to me and then took it away from me the same day. Mm-hmm. So I went through a little phase where I had to go back out of the neighborhood and do other stuff because he didn't want me to do it. And then eventually I showed up there every day until he knew I was solid enough to start spending my own $40, $50 to double me up. So it, it was a it was a, about a four-month transition to me going full-fledged, like no more sports, no more after-school program, boys and girls clubs, shooting pool with the kids and going swimming on the weekends. I was in front of the liquor store or the wash house getting to some money, man. I mean, I, I, it, it was too much for me to watch, stand around and watch. Like I, I would rather had never had the opportunity to do it than once I had the chance to do it, I couldn't, somebody telling me, don't do it again. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yo, how did... It's funny because I was one of the guys that one of your friends, right, that probably needed the bread and and was you know like mm-hmm. on a subsidized housing and shit like that. Mm-hmm. And I always came up and, and uh, I never understood because I had friends that lived in the same neighborhood. Yeah, but in my mind back then, I didn't think we all were equal. I didn't understand even like like ten, eleven. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand that we all live in the same project. Okay, I thought that like because he had Jordans. And he had a game system that he was doing better than me. Whole time I look back on it, I'm like, bro, we always living in damn projects. Always living yeah. in subsidized houses. Like, so I say that to say, I used to think like it was always the ones that was uh like in a better situation than me mm-hmm. that wanted to like go out and be a, a, act a, act a fool, be a yeah. knucklehead, sell drugs. And from your perspective, being somebody who, who came from a good home and you had friends that probably were struggling, like what? How, why was you? Why did you even go that route? What made you go that route? Okay, so I'm that's a, I'm glad you asked me that. So to go back to what you asked me a little bit ago, at school, right, there was a free lunch program. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Well, I had to pay $1.25 for my lunch back then, but we all ate the same food. Yep. So I ran home at about eight years old, in between seven and eight, maybe seven and eight, and I was like, Mom, Mom, why do I have to pay $1.25 for my lunch? And we all eating the same food. They get it for free. They're laughing at me. They're talking smack to me because I pay for lunch and they get it for free. It's the same food. I don't like it. Put me on free lunch program with them. No, shut up. You, your dad and I work. Matter of fact, we don't even want you hanging with those kids over there. Matter of fact, stay home. You go up this way towards the hills and play with the kids over there instead of going down there playing with those kids that are on subsidized income free lunch. And I'm like, no, I don't like that. They're my friends. I like them better. Those uppity kids over there, they think they're better than everybody. But me and these dudes, we climb fences. We chase dogs. We do everything together. We play basketball, stick ball. We do that. That's more fun than going to sit in somebody's house that has popsicles and all this overflowing food in a refrigerator. But my other friends over here are starving. So when I start noticing the, the gap, I realized also we're not the same but we eating the same food. I can walk to his house or ride a bike to his house in 10 minutes, but he has no food in the refrigerator. Like his mom never comes out of her room. We don't know what she's doing in there. Like something's different happening, but I want to help my friends out. So that's when we got to pushing those baskets, making $7 in a day. So you're going to make $7 in a day. Back then you get a pound of ground beef, a loaf of bread, some cheese and some potatoes, and we got burgers. And I felt good about doing that And then my homeboys, it's three of us, we get to go make burgers that we came up on ourselves. But his mom never still came out the room. Mm. She stayed in that room. She might have had a rock. And she was in there with that rock. So whatever. So we're going to do it again the next day. And then a little candy hustle, the $1 boxes and go get donations. Now we can go get $40, $50 in a day so they can put food in the refrigerator for a week. You know what I mean? And this is a kid that's 10 years old having Mm -hmm. to figure out real life how to put food on the table. I didn't. My dad went shopping twice a week. My Mm -hmm. mom went one time. My dad went one time. We, after school, could come to my house and swipe out the refrigerator. And then they were like, well, they really don't have food at their house? Because they they, they didn't know either because they wouldn't go to those kids' houses. But they was like, we just don't want you over there. So I was able to to understand fast that it's, it's not... It's not going the way it's planned. It, this this is not looking good for our community. It's not looking good for our people. You know what I mean? It wasn't a lot of white people in the community at that time. It was just us. We were there, and we had to look, get it how we live. Mm. That's 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 how it actually actually happened. So once the hustling start and the dealing started, you know, I was sneaking to do it because the OGs didn't want us dropping out of school. They didn't want us to be 
um, um, not uh, going in the house past the street lights. So I was really limited to how much of it I can do. But I mean, like I said, by then I was already so far involved in it. It almost was no turning back. Yo, it's it's crazy, man. It's so many, <laughs> so much to talk on, touch on what you said because it's it's kind of like almost triggering because the fact that. Like we hear about racism all the time in our country, right? Mm -hmm. But I like, and I'm I might get killed for this, but I don't care. Not killed literally, but uh, I might get slammed for this. But I never was big on like racism mm -hmm. as much as I was big on classism. Classism. Yeah, I feel like classism is the biggest uh, division in our in our country, and it, like the biggest separation. It is. Because even how like you said, like your parents probably didn't understand. Like they don't not have food. But I'm like, man, now it was times where like niggas ain't have nothing. Like, yeah. I mean, like white wonder bread and had to like put syrup on it. You feel me? Yeah. So it's like, <clears throat> just hearing, hearing you say it is like, it's crazy that it's people that really don't think that really that don't exists. know. Yes. But even still to the point, it's frustrating. It's kind of like, it gets me emotional because it's like going through that. It sets you back years, bro, because now you think that's what your life gotta be. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. right. Like, like it's like you. I'm listening to you, like, man. I want to be with them. Like, I want free lunch, and it's like, bro, it's a blessing not to have free lunch. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like, and I think about my times. It's like, cause I was getting teased for getting free lunch. Mm -hmm. I was getting teased because my mom was using drugs. You feel me? Like, she was the one, and like in the neighborhoods, like where I'm from, and not to make this about me, but like the neighborhoods where I'm from, like. My peers, their older brothers was the ones selling drugs. Okay. So, of course, my peers know my mom is one of the ones buying drugs. You get what I'm saying? So, like, mm -hmm. I'm getting teased for that, so I'm fighting all the time. But I say that to say, as I became an adult, I, saw, I started to see that I had these patterns of, like, thinking that things got to be hard. Right? I mm -hmm. got to go through this to see the, the top. Or I got to go through this, this type of struggle to see success. And that's not necessarily true. No, it's not necessarily true, but, I mean... Uh, a, a victim of circumstance, if if you want to say that, or uh, a product of your environment. Because had I never saw that, like, okay, for instance, my next door neighbor, he chose a totally different route. He played with the kids up the school, uh, up to he up the hill instead of down the hill. He um he never went to the liquor store. His parents actually did not allow him to go to the corner market or a liquor store, so he never even saw crack before mm. he never even saw that but then when i look at the way his life turned out later in life him not being exposed to certain things bit him in the ass because when he got into some tight situations he didn't know how to handle himself mm. he almost like like got taken advantage of he got scammed or you know you know what i mean like robbed and people just like preyed on him because he didn't have any i don't want to say game he didn't have the knowledge like Everybody needs a little bit of both, a little bit of street smarts, but you definitely have to have the knowledge and be educated as well because that way it, it, it'll be hard to get something by you. So what I did was, I mean, tried my hardest to get in it because I saw that that was what everything was transitioning to. So I almost asked for this trouble. I asked for that trouble rather because, like I said, the money start coming in. I start actually putting it up, seeing some progress. Next thing you know, I'm going on 13 years old. Some of the kids that um, got in it at the same time as me that are doing it for straight survival, they see me coming up a little bit faster than them. Excuse me. They see me coming up faster than them, so they um, end up having to buy from me. So they like, wait a minute. We started at the same time and on the same level. Why am I buying from you? Oh, well, I take it serious more. I, I take it more serious than you. You doing it and you going straight to buy shoes. Now, I'm doing it and I'm building up something so that I don't have to do this but two years. So in my mind, I'm thinking in two years, I'll have enough money uh, 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 to get out the game. So back then, all you, every, all drug dealers wanted was a kilo. That was the only thing we wanted to do. If I get a kilo, my life going to change forever. I'm going to be straight. I never have to look back, and I'm going to be able to feed the whole hood, right? But that was a so stupid of a small goal that all it did was just disrupt my mind, our minds, because I wasn't the only one with that goal putting money in the shoebox every day, every day, until I figure I had enough to get that amount of dope. Mm. I mean. Yo, put, put your mic down a little bit. Come on. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, wait. So you said, like, you was you got, first of all, you ain't need to do it, though. So you said, I'm, I'm just trying to get out the game. It's like, but you technically ain't need to be in the game. 
Well, technically, I didn't need to be in the game. However, but once you, like I said, once you're exposed to something, then it's hard for you to unexpose yourself yep. to it. You can't unsee what you saw. Yeah. So, mind you, I told you my parents were both, both working class citizens. They wanted nothing to do with this. They went to church. They went to work. They came home. They were property owners. They had cars. We didn't have no government assistance. Matter of fact, they got mad around tax time because they had to always pay. They didn't get money back based, based off two incomes in one household. But my dad started noticing a change. Like, hold on, what's going on? You don't need lunch money. What's going on here? And then he sneaks in my room and finds my pager in a pocket full of money. So he immediately wakes me up because he assumes that I must be hustling. This was like forbidden because you now, I'm, he's like, you're a part of what's destroying our community. You're going to get the fuck up out of here. You ain't doing this up under my roof. It's only one man up in here and it's me. So this is when things really start to go bad because Pops was serious about it. And he kind of gave me a little warning like, man, give me the money and give me the pager or you got to get up out of here, man, because I'm not going to lose my house. You're not going to put your mom and your little brothers at risk over this activity that you're doing. You chose to be with those people. And in the way he said those people offended me because it's like, dog. Them is my friends. They're yeah. not those people. They're my people. They're my people. Don't tell me there's no, the, like, those people or little people or whatever the case may be. So he um he really got on me heavy about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he started watching me. He started watching my movements. Now, again, I'm a kid that's nowhere near as smart as my father because he ended up catching me red-handed. He catching me where he caught me red-handed, and then he um he threw me out. He's like, no, you got to go today. That's it. I'm not having it. I warned you before. No more warnings. You got to get out. So my mom, she attempted to save me. Like, he'll stop. He'll stop. Just just let's put him in a different school. Let's whatever we have to do. He's like, no, 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 no. He has to go now. So I got put out the house by 14 years old. By 13 years old, I was out the house already. I had to live from pillar to post, go live with, in crack houses now. So now I'm really in it because Pop's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be embarrassed by you. And then he reported me as like a um a runaway truant. Like um like um he's not living here, so whatever he does is nothing to do with us. Mm. He actually did report me and um and went downhill, man. Now now I get to see the real life effects of it sleeping in crack houses where people are just doing everything under the sun as far as, you know, women turning dates for a hit, burglaries, robberies, um, um, any scheme, any scam, anything you can think of just to get a hit. So I'm like, damn, this shit is real is more, is much deeper than I thought. So it was no way I could go back home. So now I'm just living in some $20 a night hotels. I live with some friends that in the, in the apartments for a while. I thought that was the best thing I could have did though, live in the apartments. Now I'm here with the homies. Mm. And I was asking for that. So now I'm over here with them, but then after a while, I realized like, uh it's 17 people in this one apartment. This ain't working for me. I be hiding my little stash and it's coming up missing. I need to get my own spot. So by then I was working on getting my own spot. But in the midst of all of this, I'm still growing a little small movement. I'm growing a little small movement at a young age because I figured if it's other people in our community that made $100,000 off of it, I can too. Yo, this is insane. I'm listening to your story, bro, and it's like, this is what my podcast is really about, bro. It's like to show mm -hmm. people that we are more similar than different. Mm -hmm. Bro, you from the other side of the country, bro. You from Oakland, California. Oakland, California. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. You came up with two parents, good family, house. I came up in a project. It happened, <laughs> but our stories are so linear, yeah. bro. Like, I've watched my mom's literally, like, sleep in crack houses. Like, I've wow. had to visit my mom in a crack house, right? Yeah. And, like, <clears throat> at 12 or 13, I'm listening to your story, but it's like, Look how we ended up on the same track almost mm -hmm. because at 12 or 13, I knew that I couldn't follow the footsteps of my mom's. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. knew that yeah. I couldn't follow the footsteps of the of the dope boys on the, on, the, on the corner. Like, at 12 or 13, I knew that, yo. I told my mom's at 12 years old, I said, I'm going to be something because I'll be damned if, if I die and I'm nothing. That's a waste of a generation. I literally told her at mm -hmm. 12. Mm -hmm. So, hearing your story, even, like, the fact that she was like, man, stay with my homies. I have to, like, hide my stash. I remember staying with my like my uncles and stuff, having to have my food, my oodles and noodles, my tuna fish, mm -hmm. everything in a tote, yeah. having to like put it up, and like my uncles and stuff would like steal my food. Yeah, I remember that. So like hearing your story, and it's like man, it's just crazy how we could be from two different parts of the world or the country yeah, yeah. and still witness the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I was I was wondering like, just the the difference is, you had the foundation. Yeah. 
And I'm wondering, do you think even now, like to all the businesses that, sh that you're doing, do you think that some people have that 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 foundation is like it's just instilled in them from where they come from? Far as like you said, when you was hustling, you was stacking your money up. Mm -hmm. That came from something, mm -hmm. right? It came from somewhere where your other homies they was hustling, they was buying joints because they mm -hmm. might want to be cool. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that character trait was something that you was instilled in as a as, as younger than twelve, mm -hmm. or that was something that you just already had in you? Um, nah, because again, like my older cousins, of course, they wouldn't condone that behavior. My older cousins wouldn't condone that. So um, they had came up like BMWs. Um, I mean, everything, donkey ropes, gold, jewelry. They had everything. So I knew that they couldn't have been hustling day by day. So, okay, you just think about it. Um, you, you get something for 200, no matter what it is. You sell it for 400 and you re rinse and repeat. If I'm sticking to the script and I'm only doing that, then the result of that has to be profit. So once I realized that and I start seeing some form of profit, I, I I made I made my mission about the profit, but I overlooked so many things. Like at that age, I was desensitized. I didn't like police at all. They came into our community. They beat people up. They let murderers run wild in our community. They wouldn't arrest them. They knew what was going on here, but when they needed to look good, they'll come in and do a sweep. They'll jump out and just arrest everybody hanging in front of the liquor store, the wash house. And then, like I said, put it on the news. But once I saw that you can really make profit off of this, I'm like, well, let me take advantage of it. Because what if everything stops tomorrow? Mm. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be the one hustling for survival. Even, that even thought to this process, day. Not to cut you off, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you think, like, how, how was you able to get that thought process? Because, again... To, it sounds easy, but mm -hmm. again, you got friends who's not trying to just make profit. They trying to get it to get some food. They trying to get it to get some clothes. They trying to get it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you ain't really needed to to get anything else. So mm -hmm. I could save. Like, do you think that came from your parents? Like that thought process, that mindset of like, I'm just in it to make profit. Nah, because at that point, I, I was kicked out the house. Okay. So I do. I, I was kicked out the house, and I, I wasn't allowed back home. Like every now and then, I would sneak in to, to 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 take a shower, and then my dad would always know I came in, and he just didn't want me in there because he knew I was hustling. Right. But the but the, the 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 being able to um, I I actually did like math right in school. I did. Let me get, let's go back to that. In school, the math class, the multiplication, the long division, and uh, and all of that, those equations, I like that. So I'm like, okay, bam, if I'm at this rate right here, I'll have ten thousand dollars in three months, right? Because it was just like put up three hundred a day, ooh wee, ooh wee. I mean, uh, put you put up a hundred a day would be three thousand a month, and then I went to put up three hundred a day. I have to save three hundred a day. I can eat off the odd money, and then like. Making my first thousand dollars profit led to okay, I want three, five, seven, and now I want ten. So once you get about ten thousand dollars as a kid, that does something different to my. It did something different to my brain because I'm like, wow. So the sky is really the limit. I bet you I can make a hundred. I bet mm, I can make a hundred. Okay. I made ten. I can make a hundred. Okay. Damn. Okay. So do you think that in this case, and because I'm I'm a fast forward a little bit, but do you think? People that has a, that are exposed to money early on are able to make more later on in life. Um, again, once you're exposed to something, you can't unexpose yourself to it. So yes, so me being exposed to that, I knew that if I if I just practiced the same routine, if I if I stayed on routine, if I stayed on 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 path, if I stayed. Rinsing and repeating, rinsing and repeating over and over, it would turn into something. But I just didn't know exactly what. I mean, of course, I didn't know what. So do you think the issue with most adults that's unable to, like, live a successful life, make a lot of money, is because they wasn't exposed to the money early on? Um, <laughs> I, I think it's more of a discipline issue, man. I mean, it, it, with so many things in our face now, it, our chances are slimmer of being successful because marketing is at an all-time high. They market everything on the sun to all humans because um they know we'll buy it. Like I'm talking about stuff we know damn well we don't need. So if you keep every you, you keep all of these things popping up in our faces all the time, we'll buy it. But a person that's disciplined will be like, no, I'm not getting that. I'm staying on my path because I want to retire at 45 years old or 50 years old, opposed to 70 years old and being a Walmart greeter or maybe working in a gas station because I didn't. Uh, I wasn't disciplined in my younger my younger um, years because you have people now 
25 year olds, 20 year olds that have never been really exposed to money and they just blowing up and they making more money than ever in a two or three year period because they just got disciplined and practice exactly. Uh, they did exactly what they said they was going to do. Mm. And if you, when you do that, I just think that um, you have the best chances of su su succeeding is just doing that because I mean, I wasn't rich. We wasn't rich, but even the people having 30, 50, hundred thousand dollars, they really wasn't rich, but I knew I would rather have that than just keep rotating the same 500 or a thousand dollars and doing this every day, all day for survival. Because if we get caught, we're going to jail. But if we get caught by the wrong robber, we might get killed. You know what I mean? So it, it, the risk was clear also mm. that this is not promised to, to me. You better take advantage of it now. So that's what I tried to do. Were you uh, able to just walk away or like something happened for you to um, say, say you got to like go through something tragic for you to really learn your lesson? Mm -hmm. How was you able to understand? So like, um, at about age 14, I started getting arrested. I started getting arrested, but it was juvenile hall. So me having a few dollars, I was able to pay my way out of that trouble. I got my own attorney at like 15 years old when I got caught with a bag of work uh, about $4,000, I got caught with a bunch of stuff. So they were offering me the California Youth Authority, which is the juvenile prison. So I got me a lawyer, and he ends up getting me a plea bargain for a, um out-of-the-area placement in a boy's home, like a boy's home. Like you have to live on campus and do everything. It's almost like a little mini army facility ran thing. So once I did that, it changed my perspective because when I got out, I, I was like a little shook for a minute. I got out I was like, oh, man, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. But instead of going back to selling um, crack, I went to start selling weed because I'm like, well, it's a lesser evil. Mm -hmm. Selling weed is a lesser evil. And it was it was um, fast paced, high profit. So I got um, totally um, consumed by that. But once I got consumed with it again, I only focused on the money. So. I'm chasing it again. I'm chasing. I'm chasing. I'm chasing every day, all day, all day, all day. And then once I did the, I, I, once I really picked up on the concept of that, I saw the money running up even faster because everybody that hustled smoked Smoke weed, weed. Yeah, and don't. then even the ones that were square trying to listen to the chronic and be a part of the culture, they came from the suburbs to buy weed. So that's when I probably really, really start seeing money is when I transitioned to the weed game. And I'm, and a after that, I want to say I counted up my first about one twenty, one hundred twenty thousand dollars 15 years old, about 14, 15 years old, coming out of that little boys' home institutional thing. And I was counting it up then at that point. So, I, I of course, I got big-headed, and I really thought I was that dude, but not, not really realizing that. It was so many components to just doing any type of illicit activity. And then I was falling victim to it. I was smoking weed every day. Mm. See what I mean? I was drinking liquor underage every day just to function. So these poisons, toxin thing, toxins going into my body was corrupting my thinking even further, mm. if that makes sense. Damn. So how did you get out of that? Like you got arrested again or just? Um, so how I got out of that was... uh. I actually did get arrested again, but this time I ended up going to uh, the adult jail, which is now I have a, a felony on my record for possession for sales of marijuana. So I'm thinking that um, all is lost, but uh, actually it wasn't. I could have transitioned all the way out the game from there, but here it is. I'm um, shit. I'm trapped, man. I'm still in the same community. I'm living like in the neighborhood that we hustle in, have a small one bedroom apartment. That's my own apartment in the same community that either making you rich or totally destroying you. Or you probably just need to get up out of there. It, it was kind of only one of one of two things that was happening to the majority of the people that lived there that stayed there. Mm. So you went to the federal prison. So what ended up happening was, um, at this time, once I got 18, 19 years old, my um my lady at the time got pregnant and I was expecting my first child. So um I was living off the money that I once I got a uh, um it's Santa Rita, I started living off of the money that I had made before because I didn't want to go back to Santa Rita. And um she was pregnant and she uh she wasn't making much money, but she was doing okay, but she needed my assistance more than ever. So what I did was I um was working actually kind of just trying to work with the family business. I was trying to transition out of that shit, but um, money was slow. Money was slow. And I found myself taking out more than I was bringing in. So I went back outside with my cousins and my little brother, my cousin, my younger brother, he's not little, he's actually bigger than me. 
he was already hustling. He never got up out of it. And what we did was um we we just went full fledged, man. I went once I got back outside and I started seeing what kind of money was in. We kind of transition. I transitioned back into the harder stuff again. It was a lot of money involved in, and then we just ran it up, man. So so long story short, about by the time of I'm at about eighteen. Going on my 20-year-old, I made enough money to support my family, but I also went ahead and made enough money to start seeing real money, like two, three, four, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, like, like I said, twenty, thirty thousand 30000 a month at this point at that young age, which I wasn't ready for. I wasn't ready to make that kind of money, but once I jumped back in it, we was going seriously at this time. It just, it just everything in my whole life changed as a young adult, and that's kind of probably what molded me into the person that I am today, seeing that right there early on. So you just stopped, like, or that's when you got arrested for the felony? I got arrested for the felony. I backed off for for like almost a year. I backed all the way off and was living off money that I had saved. Okay, so I thought you said you was living off the money you saved and you went back outside. I went so back outside. That, when, when you I went st- back outside, what happened after that? Oh, when I went back outside, we just ran it up, man. My... <clears throat> My cousins, like, okay, so we're from a specific neighborhood, Oakland. We was not gang banging, and it was like um, every neighborhood was is separate. So in our neighborhood, we're the only ones hustling there. So since I've been there forever, I grew up here, my family lives here, I was able to kind of like get a pretty good position where uh, it was enough respect there where I was able to make the money according to um, – the position that I, the position that I had, mm. so um, we just start running up. I start making like two, three thousand a day profit. You know what I mean? Living good, putting up thirty, forty thousand dollars a month. That went to about fifty thousand dollars a month. And I want to say, by twenty one years old, I had my first million. Dang. I actually didn't know what that was. I didn't know how because all I was doing was putting it up, putting it up, putting it up <laughs> twenty, putting up ten, fourteen, ten, fourteen, eight, ten, and then by the time I finally counted it up. I was like, oh wow, this shit is really serious. But it kind of it kind of was a damaging thing because what I start doing then is I start spending money as if I was a multimillionaire instead of just a person barely making it up to that point. Because now we're buying weight, we're selling weight, we're kind of almost like supplying this neighborhood. And it's like, if we don't do it, somebody else will. Right. If I don't do this, somebody else will. And I'm here and I'm trapped in it. So I kind of like did my best to make some sense of it. And that's kind of how it went. went, went did you ever know. get caught from then? So after that, yeah, I actually did get caught inside inside of a house that we was using to process stuff. And they came in there and they got all of this drugs. They got me. They got a lot of money. So that's when I started taking losses. At that at that particular case, I lost like three, 400000 I ended up having to... um pay for a lawyer, but I didn't really get no time because I forfeited everything they found, paid for the lawyer, and got myself out of trouble with just, like, go to state prison, turn around, and come out. So, but now I'm... But you already had a felony at that time, right? Yeah, I did. I had a felony, but it was like a a probation felony. Okay. So this time, like I said, you still hire the best lawyer, find one little loophole, and they, like, go sit in the county jail for, what, I want to say six months. And then go to the state prison, San Quentin. And then once I got there, they check me in. You kind of do a little rotation. And then I got right out. So that really wasn't a lesson for me. That was like, damn, that's it. That was pretty easy. I mean, it, and once I got there, everybody I know was there. Mm. It wasn't like um, it wasn't like whatever prison you see on the movies. Because they said the people who are um, the most afraid of prison are the ones that never been. But the ones that been before and actually saw what it is, they know that they could probably handle it if they went back. Mm. You know what I mean? So that's why the recidivism rate is probably high because if you went to prison, you know that, oh, man, nobody's going to try to rape you. Nobody's going to try to take advantage of you. Nobody's going to try to assault you up in there. The people that's doing that wanted to do it. Mm. You know what I mean? The homies are there. We're going to be in there kicking it. We have money. We're going to be able to order food from the outside. We're going to be stuff like that. So I didn't learn a lesson from that. My lesson came when I did get a long prison sentence in the state state so i ended up getting 12 years state Damn. that you have to do half of that but i ended up going to like a um a, um work release program so i did off of 12 i ended up doing about um yeah about five four and a half or five so that right there shook me up i was like oh my god i can't keep going through this can't keep going through i have to change something i have money i was able to be successful in 
hustling or whatever success would be considered in hustling. So I'm like, I can't do that anymore. I need to transition into something else. Well, so you did five years like in jail, in jail. Yes. Like what was the the craziest thing you've seen? Oh man, you see you like 21 at the time, right? At this time. No, no. At this time I was, I was going on 20 about, no, I was 23 because I got out. I was 23. Was about twenty three. So, I mean, you still like, a kid though. Yeah, I'm a kid. People but sleep on like people think twenty one year olds is grown. Like, nah, bro. Nah, nah, nah. We're still maturing. We're still maturing. But see, me knowing everybody when I got there, it was a thing of um, you only have to participate in what you want to participate in. Some people are forced in prison to be a part of a prison gang because they need this gang for survival. They might have a couple little skeletons in their closet that they don't want to be revealed so they go group up with some people and they put in work in prison so they're they're protecting people and they're protected but i saw people in there you know um ma- mainly getting disciplined by their own people of course it was race riots in there um the blacks against the mexicans the whites against the mexicans whites against the blacks um um, um it, it was that in there but me i kind of stood clear of it i stood clear of it because i, I was like uh I don't want to be be a part of that, man. I mean, those people are, are just reckless, man. They're going to go wreck themselves, and then they're going to end up in a shoe and getting sent to a prison all the way across the state. I'd rather have my visits, be at a prison two hours away from home, get my visits, be able to see my daughter and stuff like that. So I didn't I didn't really get involved in that. And I saw, like, I saw COs get attacked. I saw a CO get attacked. But once I got to the lower level facilities, everybody just wanted to go home. Mm. You know what I mean? So I did, did my best to make sure I um, was going to come home because I had plans for when I get home. That's a hell of a story, bro. So how the hell did you go from that to, like, now you're doing credit shit? Like, you're doing a lot of things now. Mm, after that, so I got out from that, and I didn't even hustle no more, but I found a, another way to get some money. I found a way to get some money. It was like a um a white-collar. There's a little white collar, little, um, I guess they call it a play, a little system that I got from a guy being in state prison. So while in state prison, it was a guy that I met there. He had turned me on to some people to go meet up with when I got out and I met up with those people. So within about a year of um, being out of state prison, I kind of got on board with some of this guy's people. What was it? It was like some, um, I guess you could say um, financial, financial, uh, uh, um, no. Nigga, what? Uh, <laughs> what was it? It was, it was kind of doing fraud, some fraud. Okay. We was, we was doing fraud. Okay. Yeah, we was doing fraud. Anything related with the uh, checks and credit cards and um, people's personal information, like basically credit card information. And okay. At that time, it was heavy where um, the our, our actual play was more of uh, you get a person's credit card information, which is insured, and then you're able to go pull a certain amount of money off of it. We knew how much we can pull off of it, but based on having real specific um, 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 profiles or spreads. Like okay. if you get a real specific spread, uh, um, spread, we knew like, okay, I'm gonna make ten off of this. I'm gonna make fifteen off of this. So that kind of money start coming in, and then I was able to make up for all of the money that I lost in about a year and a half, two years. Damn. In a year and a half, two years, I was able to make up for that money and not even have to touch no dope. But the the, the part about it is, is I was doing it with a homie of mine, well, who I thought was my homie, a person I came up with, and then he got into some trouble and then he lined me up. So what he did is he started asking me for drugs and he knew I wasn't really selling drugs no more, but he told the feds that he and I were doing this kind of fraud. And they like, well, it'll be too hard for me to prove this fraud stuff, plus it doesn't carry as much time, so set him up on a drug buy. And then, you know, he asked me for months and months and months to set him up with a drug buy. And then I'm like, nah, we don't need that. Why are we going to do drug buys? Like, we're going to make 8 Gs, 10 Gs, 20,000 this week. But eventually, it's my homie. He brought some guy in that he said was his out-of-town buyer, and it was like money on the floor. I'm like, okay, well, shit. How much are we gonna make? This him right here. He cool. The guy went out to he went out um to clubs with us, bars with us. He messed with girls with us, but he actually ended up being a um federal informant. And looked like a real nigga, just like us. So um, dressed fresh, Gucci at the time. We was Gucci'd up, chains, watches, Rolexes. Everybody had these Rolex on, but he's trying to buy. So what he did was he made a small buy, and then after that, he asked for a large order, which was kind of weird to me. He's like, 
yeah, I want to get like in between five and seven kilos. And I'm like, what? I'm like, uh, no, nah, I don't think I want to get involved with that, bro. I'm past that. Plus, yeah. if I, I said this on, on, a, on a wiretap, I said, if I do that, then I'm going to have to get the money from you, take it to my man, me and him count it up, then I'll bring you the stuff. So that's pretty much agreeing to make the deal. Mm. So what it's called is conspiracy. You conspire to make a drug deal for a large amount of drugs. So that was enough for them to send it to a grand jury and then um, come back and arrest me on that. So wait, and, you just did five years. Yeah. So now you got to do more time. So I ended up getting another seven years. So total I got sentenced in state prison was 12. Right. And then I got out and I ended up getting seven years in federal prison, which was a total of 19 years. So off of the 19 years, I did close to 13. No, I did 12. I did 12. I did 12 for sh Okay, I did five straight five. I did about 12 and some change. 12 years, six months. 12 years, eight months. Total. This shit sound like a movie. You, the 12 years, six one. months total. I mean, Ken, no, because Ken and I met through my cousin before I went to federal prison, and we actually were promoting shows. Like, Ken introduced me to a guy who knew another guy and my cousin. Actually, I, what had happened was I, I, um, I forgot. That was maybe 010. I had a Bentley a, 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 of the year. I had that of the year Bentley Rolex. We going out to the club, extra watches for whoever come with us. We all look good together. We don't want these girls to know who the rich is, like that kind of thing. And I met Ken. So we start giving shows and um, he, he actually tried to call cap on me. Ken did. You know, your, your boy Ken that introduced me to you. <laughs> he tried to call cap on me because he said that he could get future. And I'm like, well, how much do Future want, man? You know, he was up and coming at the time. He had that Tony Montana out, and he said 40000 I said, run it. Tell him to come on. So he looked at me like, and he asked my cousin, well, who car is this? This is his car? And and he got, do we have the money? Because once I make the call, yeah, Future coming. Yeah. So they made the call within two days, and I deposited the money. I did a wire transfer. So we had Future in the Bay Area before anybody did. And I like, I think um, I look back on that. And even Future, Future told me that he was going to be the biggest rapper. He said, I'm going to be the biggest. I swear. He looked at me. We had a, got him a, mar a room at the Marriott, Mar Grand Marquis, some whatever. He had all these special requests. But I, I can understand why. When you're the best, you can do that. And um, he told me he would be the biggest. He told me that. He said, I like your style, man. But it's just like that kind of stuff just, just don't last long, man. He said, just don't last long. But but back, back to what I was saying about Ken, I, when I put that pulled that play, and we paid that 40 bands, right? 20 up front, 20 today when they land, and we paid all cash, whatever, how that, however, whichever way that went. So me and Ken, we kind of been locked in ever since. So we start doing other artists like YG. We start doing um like like um like a lot of parties and club promotion stuff. So I thought that was gonna be my way out of the game, actually. Cause it made good money. Like we was having a party almost every 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 month at least. You know what I mean? We was doing something or another. We start traveling with it a little bit and um Little did I know things was crumbling downhill because the guy I told you about was around. Mm. He was around, but the whole time <laughs> he has to go check in with the federal government and give them an update on me. Like, yeah, man, it's good. It's good. He's going to agree. He's going to agree. He's going to agree. And then I end up agreeing to that deal, which ultimately ruined my life. Well, I don't want to say it ruined my life, but it changed my life forever because in federal prison, I, I, I must say, I learned so many things that I probably wouldn't have learned had I not went to federal prison. And I'm not condoning that. I'm not saying that that's the way to go. But while I was in federal prison, I was able to talk to people who had started $100 million companies. These are white people, Jewish people, Armenian people, black people. Like I, I ran into the one of the biggest multi-level marketing company CEOs in America, which was a black man. And for some reason, he took a liking to me. He told me, you want to make some real money, become a marketer. Sales people and marketers make some of the biggest incomes in the country, and they'll continue to do it because people will buy whatever you put in front of them. So I was able to speak to people, and I, I became more financially, liter financially literate than I ever were, was before. I mean, because think about this. I had over a million dollars in between about 20 and 22, and I lost it. When I caught that case, I gave 85% of it back. Then I did it again when I got out of state prison. I ran up like two. I ran up about two and some change then. But I was partying, drinking, jumping on flights, kicking it. Everybody come with me. So I was spending it like water that time trying to say you only live once, enjoy the money. But then 
catch another case, and that pretty much wipes me out. So my thought is that you give a person money that never had money and they're not used to having money with no instructions, you just watch them destroy themselves. You don't have to do anything to them. They'll do it to themselves. So one of my things that I'll tell people now I talk to clients every day and I'll talk to my friends and family that I actually care about. And I'll be like, well, don't wait to go get rich. Go get rich now so you can hurry up and get it out your system. And then when you lose it all, when you do it again, you'll know what to do with it. You'll have a better understanding of the money, because if you don't have an instruction booklet and you just look, OK, I don't know if you know, but during the pandemic, multiple people came up on high six figures, some of them even seven figures. Mm -hmm. Most of them people now need to borrow $100. Mm. I'm talking about $100. So these people were given $100,000, $250,000, $500,000, some of them even a million dollars that they didn't necessarily work for. So what happened with those people was they were free to just roam the earth and buy money. and I mean, buy, spend money and buy whatever they wanted to, to buy. And they all fell off. So mm. had they not got that money, and they went out and worked for that money or even hustled for that money. And it took them three years to get that money instead of three to four months. Then they probably would appreciate it more. So you don't have to do nothing to a fool because they'll destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. So I was the fool. I went and made money at 21 years old, like real money, like shoe boxes and duffel bags full of money, stinky money, money that be like, man, oh man, hurry up and just get it out of this house. Get it out of this house because I don't, I can't sleep at night with that money in this house. But it went away from me as fast as I made it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, not to glorify having that kind of money, but it's just like, I think the earlier you run it up, the better. Mm. The faster you run it up, the better, in my opinion. Some people will disagree, but I think that's one of the things that's going to show your true character and let you know um, who you are and what you can really become. You know, it sounds like the 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 only difference between, like, somebody that makes a lot of money, and I hear this a lot, and somebody that doesn't, is they're willing, the person that does make a lot of money is willing to make sacrifices, or not even sacrifices, I don't wanna say sacrifices, take risk. Mm -hmm. Like you took a lot of risk. Yeah. And like on one side, you can look at it like, man, well, he's always been somebody to make money, and that's why he has this career now that's making a lot of money. But it's like, yeah, it was, it was a lot of risk involved in every one. Mm -hmm. You just gotta choose the risk. Yeah, my, my risk tolerance has always been high from a, from a young kid, which I, like I said, because I was desensitized. So I'm like, well, oh, I, I don't know if you ever rolled dice before. So you roll dice. Whatever happens to your money can change in one roll. Mm. So you roll, you got, a, you got a six point, you roll a seven, it's over with, no matter how much money you bet on that point. But the same thing goes with hustling, trapping, or you put all of that energy into just building something positive and you just bet everything you have on it no matter what the outcome going to be because most people say they have faith, but they really don't. Mm. Because if you have faith, you're going to move like whatever happens, I'm doing this anyway. But <laughs> when you doubt yourself and you overhear that you and you really don't believe, I mean, think about it, man. It's still a big deal to become a millionaire, but most people still won't do it. So I tell people all the time the blueprint of exactly what I do and how I'm making money now, and I don't charge them any money f for telling them this information, and they never do nothing with it because they don't want to take the risk. But I'm like, if you go take the risk and do exactly what I told you to do, you will make more money than you're making on your job. Same thing goes with um, 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 crypto. Nobody believed in crypto. Nobody believed in crypto. But believe it or not, when I got out of federal prison after that seven year bid, which I did almost six because it's 87.5 percent. A lot of people think it's 85 percent. It's 87.5 percent. I did almost six years off of a seven year sentence. I mean, I got in a little trouble, but that's what I did. But I took a risk on crypto before I went into federal prison. And when I came out, that's what saved me. Mm. It wasn't like I had millions in cash when I came out because, as we know, as fast as it comes, as fast as it go. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, I had I had something left, but I had cryptos. They're like, I don't believe in that stuff. It's a scam. You're not going to ever make no money in that. But without that, I probably wouldn't have had the start that I had coming from being gone close to six years, not making any money. Mm. You know what I mean? So what exactly would you say you do now? Right now, I just think I'm a finance. I'm a um. I I have a title of a financial services specialist. So what I do is I just help people with business funding. So actually, what I've been doing and how I've been making my primary income was um being a loan broker. So I've been helping per small businesses and people get personal loans. So while while doing that, 
it's pretty lucrative. I mean, wow. I mean, long as you have the right resources and you connect the right resources with the right person, you're going to make some money. But then what ended up happening is a lot of people may not have the credit for a loan. So I helped them with credit repair. So, okay, bam, help you with credit repair. Once you repair your credit, you probably will use me to get your business or personal financing. And then what I did discover that some people are even at a lower level than that. And they just need a grant or some type of a jump start to get their finances right. So what I did is I started a private community to help people get grants. You can get your credit fixed. And then from there, you can get a personal or business loan. So I'm actually helping people on three different levels as well as just like, um, you know, um, personal development, man. Because first of all, our mindset when we come into things aren't it, it just we're at a bad place mentally, mm. not not just our people. It's most people because um, all we see is what they put in front of us. So we're comparing our day one with somebody's day 1,000. Mm. So we're thinking we should have what they want like um, today instead of working for it. So once you change your mindset and you realize that I'm not going to be where Jay is when I'm first starting my podcast, it's just no way. But if I listen to him, I watch him, and I study him, I can possibly build something and have a foundation to build off of. You know what I mean? If by chance I get to speak to him and he gives me some information, then I'll go from there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So as uh, so being in, in um the financial industry, those are the three services I provide. But I mean, ultimately, I just kind of want to help people and not see people have to go through so many struggles just to get on top. Damn, bro, this is fire. I ain't gonna lie, this is dope. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I think you probably got one of the most, uh, uh, I don't know the, exactly how to say it. God damn, I'm sorry, bro. Uh, how you turn shit on vibrate? I feel like the older I get, the the more I turn to my parents and shit. Like, I don't know how this mm -hmm. work this damn phone, but uh, I feel like you got one of the most um relatable stories to me anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to like this entrepreneurship stuff, mm -hmm. cause. It's like you really came from it, and and hearing that you you're on a path that you're on now, and it's like shit, that's well, dope as hell. Well, well, see, I get a lot of backlash though. So people come to my Instagram, they find me in um, interviews that I've done previously, and they have a lot to say. Well, you're nothing but a crom a common criminal, a common crook. Well, what I say is that well, it's it, it, it you you can. You can judge me however you choose to, but I pay my debt to society. So in America, they made a, a judicial system that says if you do this, then this is your penalty. So what if, for what I did, I served my time. So for people to still come at me and then judge me only based off of what I've done in the past instead of how I'm helping people now with resources and telling people that you do not have to go the route that I, I went. Because um, one of the biggest things that's holding America back is the scam culture. Mm. You either think you have to do a scam to come up or you think somebody like me that's trying to help you is going to scam you out of your money. Yep. So what that does is it gets you nothing. I mean, most people's goal is to be a millionaire until they become one. And then you're going to be like, uh, wow, wow, it, it's more pressure being here than I thought it would be. You know what I mean? Another thing is be like, oh, well, generational wealth is going to um, change my life and I'm going to change the dynamics of um, of, of my my um, my my of my family. I'm going to change my family dynamics by going to create this general wealth, generational wealth. But the only part about that what people seem to forget is, is like that the generation that's coming after them may not want to do what they do. Mm. It's way more new millionaires now than generational millionaires. Like the, 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 the number of new millionaires is like 10 X of people who inherited their millions. You can look it up yourself. Even shit, to be honest, bro, when it comes to success in general, you know how many people that I heard say I'm the first college graduate. I'm the mm -hmm, first mm -hmm. millionaire in my family. I'm the mm -hmm. first person that did this. Yep, it's like, yep, yep. bro. It, and it's crazy because the, the sad, not sad, but the hard thing about that as a parent is like you do something so like your parents, right? Mm -hmm. As parents, we we work our asses off our children mm -hmm. not to be able to have to go through what we exactly. go through. Just exactly. for them to choose their mm -hmm. own direction and make exactly. their own way of life. And it's like, bro, what the hell? Mm -hmm. Like so, I do all this just for you not to do this. And all you, of that. Yeah. So it took my parents about 30 years to become millionaires. <laughs> my parents are millionaires right now. They're senior citizens. They're living a pretty good life that they deserve. So I I used to say, like, what took them 30 years to do it? Well, I did it the first time by 21. Mm. But see, I participated in illicit activity and I gave it all back. 
Theirs came by way of real estate, primary income, investment property, and um, pensions, retirements, things of that nature. So I went out and did it just to know it's possible. So without any of that stuff that I told you, you do not have to do scams to get rich. You probably, most scammers will never get rich mm -hmm. because the money going to come in so fast, they're going to lose it, spend it, things of that nature. And then hustling, trapping, oh, no, no, I'm going to go get rich, trapping. Yeah, you will make money, but if you don't make the exact, if you don't make a precise decision to get out of it and move on, it's just something that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. You have a bunch of stuff that come along with that. So I just say that, don't get caught in that scam culture like most of us will. Like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to go get over on a bunch of people and make my money, and then I'm going to be all right, and I'm going to never have to look back. That's just not true. Mm. That's just not true. So I just would, would be, I just want people to see that if I can do it, anybody can, man, because I, was, I, I took the total, total long route. Like my one uncle, he passed away. He said, um, one thing about you, man, your tolerance for risk is really high and you waste a lot of time. I'm like, what you mean by that, Uncle Bud? He said, before you start hiking up that mountain, you run around it twice and tire yourself out. When you could have just carved out a path and went, up, went straight up the mountain, maybe took a couple curves, you did not have to run, a, run around it twice or three times before going up because you tired yourself out, you burnt yourself out. Mm. So had I thought like that when he told me that, I probably would have made a lot of different decisions in my 20s. Mm. You know, like now I'm in my 40s, man. And at this at this point in my life, all I want to do is extend my resources to people so that, again, they don't have to go through what I went through to have success. Mm. That's it. Bro, no, this is great. This is dope, bro. Your story is, is truly phenomenal. And it's funny because, like, you had so much success before you even got into the entrepreneurship space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, like, even before off camera, you were saying how you even paid for uh, mentorship. Yes. What made you... Being so successful, right? Like, mm -hmm. you, you ain't get big-headed. You still have a sense of humility to you. What made you, like, still invest in mentorship when you've been a hustler? Because mm, um, lear learning, uh, okay, so the unknown. How about that? The unknown. So I, I started going to conferences and traveling around the country when I, when, when I wanted to learn something that caught my attention. So, for instance, online marketing caught my attention. Digital marketing caught my attention. And um, the people who I consider to be the biggest in it, they required a fee to get in front of them. It's like, I can give you the information for free, but you're not going to use it. But if you pay me a nominal fee, then you probably are more likely to implement the things that I tell you. So I knew that um, in order for me to get um, where I needed to be, I had to invest in myself. So I've already taken all of these risks doing illicit activities that got me nothing. So if I can go spend 50, 30, 50, 100K on mentorship to learn something that I don't know, then I'm good with that. For instance, like it, it, the person I mentioned to you off camera, he's a 25-year-old person that made over $30 million online. Mm. So I hit him up. I reached out to him, even flew out to get in front of him, a 25-year-old kid. Now, I have a 25-year-old daughter. Mm. So this kid, young man rather, I get in front of him. He told me his fee it was mid-five figures. But I paid him mid-five figures in order to learn a skill that I made back 100K in the first six months, and now I'm going to be able to make money it, it, infinitely. I'll be able to make infinite money as long as I keep implementing some of the things that I learned from this guy. Another guy, like as far as um, 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 my mentor in the financial space, like he's a person that has made nine figures. It's no way for me, coming from where I come from, there's no way for me to come from where I come from to be able to get in front of a nine-figure earner. But once I did reach out to that person at a conference and speak to him directly, he told me his fee. I mean, for $5,000, if I let you work with me for $5,000 again, you won't do nothing. But if I charge you $40,000, I bet you'll do everything I say. So I don't mind paying thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for mentorship knowing that this is life-changing information. Mm. I mean, the money I invested in cars jewelry, watches, designer. I mean, all of this stuff is nothing compared to like what I can get out of a mentorship program. So like I told you, I give information out to people for free. They do nothing with it. If I charge a person for it, now all of a sudden I've people have paid me for information I have and they out earn me today. Mm. I don't feel no kind of way about that. I charge them too cheap. That's my fault. Mm. I charge them $5,000 7500 to take some information that I gave them and they wouldn't ran up two M's. 
You know what I mean? I'm like, wow. I'm and I'm just talking about the particular thing that we we discussed. So if you go run up two two thousand two million dollars off something you paid seventy five hundred, maybe five thousand to learn directly, shadow me, watch it, watch me do it over and over, and then you go start your own crew, your own team, and now one guy in particular, he has five or seven people doing business loans in a in an office, and they killing the game, all of them. Like his second person in charge make more than me. I mean, his second person on his team makes more than me, and I showed him directly to do what I do. And they, of course, added other services to it, and I'm not trying to take credit for his success. However, before he before coming to me, he may not have known what he known about what exactly that we do. Mm. You know what I mean? Damn, bro. You so how I mean? can somebody like get get to you? And I mean, I'm I'm on Instagram. I mean, I'm I'm on Instagram. I answer all of my own messages. I don't um. I don't use the bots like to respond. I mean, I feel like human connection is human connection. So you can reach me like on Instagram. My Instagram is True Lane's Way. Um, the common spelling, I mean, T R U L A N E Z W A Y. And um, reach out to me, man. Let's just figure out what I could possibly assist you with. I mean, if the relationship don't work, I mean, if the if the um if it's not organic and if it's not something that we can really make sense of, then it's no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. But I mean, a simple reach out can probably cultivate a great relationship where both people feel like they were able to gain something out of it. You know what I mean? It shouldn't be one-sided. Yeah. Everything is transactional. Everything is transactional. Yo, how many people you think you, you help like make over six figures? I mean, people I help make over six figures. Oh, wow. And it's an entrepreneurship space. In entrepreneur space. In entrepreneur space, space I want to say, woo, make over six figures. Uh, about, about at least 30 to 50. At least 30 to 50 people. But Five figures is a lot of people. Like, you can really come in and start doing some of the things that I do, some of the things that I tell you to do, and make um, an extra 5K a month. How about that? Mm. So that's cool. 5K a month, that's 60 a year uh, uh, um, along with whatever else you make. But if you really want to go crazy in entrepreneurship and if you really, really want to learn and go full-fledged, skip the day job and just go all the way, like, like, Per, it will it will be myself and then one of my mentors that I partner with. Okay, so we will both come to get. We will all come together and make a specific plan for somebody. But six figure that's a hundred k hundred hundred k a year is like ninety three hundred ninety two hundred a month. That's not really hard to make anymore. Mm -hmm. I live in California, man. You got to think, man. People in California have roommates that make two hundred thousand a year. Mm -hmm. So in California, in my area, you you need to make about three fifty minimum. So you, you 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 can live comfortably. You know what I mean? I mean, I love it in Georgia. I love it in Texas. But I'm more of a California guy. I'm a California guy. So instead of just trying to run from there, I believe I just need to make more money. Mm. And then I want to say this also. Instead of trying to just go rush and make a million a year, I think people should just go become the best 100,000 there. Mm. So if you go master the skill of making 10 to 15K a month, consistently, 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 and do it with discipline and don't run out and just buy everything you see. In a couple years, you'll be able to quit your job. You'll be able to add that income to whatever else you want to do and scale it up from there. Because my like my first, like I said, my first million dollars I ever made, I wasn't making a hundred K a month. I was only making 30 to 50. Mm. But I was doing it over and over, over and over, sticking to the script. Of course it was doing something that I'm not proud of, but the concept is the same. Anybody you know right now, I mean, you, how would you like to add an extra 30 to 50K to your income? Yo, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, it, it would definitely help. I mean, it, it, it would help. Doing what exactly though now? Because like just doing the loans? Uh, well, the okay, okay, you, 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 you can start your own credit repair company and be a loan broker. But for you, for you in particular, man, what, what you do and why, I'm, how, why I admire you is you're great at podcasting, man. Mm. So when I look at you, the way your setup is, the way that you talk, the sponsorship, you could show somebody that information right there, and it's worth ten thousand per person. Mm. Why is it worth that? Because if they do it correctly, some of them might supersede your success, but they're gonna make a lot of money. Now, I'm not telling you to go do that, but if you went and told a hundred people how to do it for free, only three of them gonna do it. Mm. But if you charge people five thousand dollars, just charge them five thousand dollars and be like, I'm gonna get you to my level or higher in podcasting, give me 10. You might only get three people to pay you the 10 per month, but they're gonna go do it. Mm. They're gonna go do that shit. And they're gonna try to outdo you, but they're not your competition because they'll always have to look at you as the sensei. Mm. You would be their sensei. But for me, yeah, you would learn being a loan broker, just helping small business and and 
helping people get personal and small business loans in your own area. You don't even have to reach past your immediate area. See, I have a little method that I use that it's 31,000 small businesses within a 20 mile radius of where I live. I can't get all of them, mm. but I don't need all of them. I just need 300 of them. Mm. I need 300 of them small businesses and I need to help them get in between 30 and 50,000 if they qualify 100 if they qualify for 150,000 I'll help them get that and of course I get compensated for that. Don't I deserve to be compensated for helping you get an extra 150? Mm. Well, even 30 or 50, I, I deserve to be compensated for that, I believe. But if you don't believe that, that's fine. You can work with somebody else. But just doing that alone, <clears throat> excuse me, if a person just does only that and listen to the blueprint I give them in their area, you don't even have to go nationwide. You can make an extra $15,000 a month. Mm. I mean, it ain't no cap here. It ain't no scam here. You don't even have to listen to me. Go to YouTube and go find somebody else that you can work with besides me. And you still can do it. That's what I'm going to say. You you don't even need me to do it. But I'm going to give them an express lane to do it and have a success. And again, starting your own credit repair company if that's something you want to do. Most people don't want to do it. But if you did want to do that, that's a five to $10,000 a month business in addition to what you do on the loans. Mm. So if you just have those two elements in your business right now, which somebody going to say, well, the credit industry is saturated. The loan business is saturated. No, it's not. It's 200,000 people doing loans. It's 20 million people that need loans, that mm. qualify for loans right now. Uh, we we can't get, uh, I mean, is, is that a good ratio? Yeah, hell yeah. You know what I mean? So it's no way you can sit here and tell me it's saturated because so many small businesses have never been contacted. they never even been contacted or offered our service before. You know what I mean? So I'm just thinking if you offer, if I offer them the service and I make it fair for them, then it's hard for them to say no. Pay me when you get your money, man. I only get paid if you get paid. Mm. I'm not a shark. I'm not a snake. I'm not here to take advantage of you, man. I mean, I know you heard these other tricks and you saw all these tricky little funny little movements, but that's not what this is. So, I mean, that's where I'm at with it. Bro, that shit is good, bro. That, that pretty- shit fire, bro. Man, one more time, uh, how they can c- contact you, how they can uh, get with you if they're trying to, like, get your services and everything. I mean, you can hit me up on Instagram. Uh, my name is True Lane Brown, and you can hit me at True Lane's Way. I'm there. I answer the messages myself. I mean, if you really want to work with me, man, it's definitely not that complicated. We'll just go through a quick little evaluation, see if we work well together, and we'll go from there. Man, that shit was good. True Lane Brown, Mr. J. Hill, J. Hill Podcast is a wrap. We out.